We're going to hear from William Basil, who is the director of AmeriCorps State and National. Uh, prior to his role as the director of AmeriCorps at the Corporation for National and Community Service, he worked in a variety of capacities over the past 37 years for the state of Washington on human resource um, employment development and national service activities. He's also served as the executive director for the Washington Commission, Washington Commission for National and Community Service, established by the governor in 1994 to implement and expand volunteerism and national service initiatives, including AmeriCorps. So we're delighted that he could be with us this afternoon representing CNCS. Wendy Spencer was with us yesterday, and she said, Brenda, here's a man you really have to meet. And he has brought great leadership to AmeriCorps, and we're thankful that he's here to share with us this afternoon. Will you welcome Mr. Basil? Come talk with us. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's just a pleasure to be here, and what a wonderful university and institution, and a, a university that certainly supports service as its core mission. Um, I wanted to thank um, all of you who are here today. Uh, as we end this uh, historic meeting, I wanted to thank uh, Secretary Duncan, and you'll hear from him in a minute, uh, Melissa Rogers, who is the special assistant to the president for and executive director of the White House Office on Faith-Based Community Initiatives. Jonathan Greenblatt, who we work with so closely at the White House Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. Uh, Reverend Mitchell, thank you for your gracious introduction. My mom would have loved it. Um, and um, the, uh, the guiding lights behind all of this, uh, Ebu, uh, on, Ebu, on working on the, as a founder of the President's Interfaith Youth Corps. This is so important to us. Um, making this connection, uh, this connection today between the President's Interfaith and Community Service Campus Challenge and the President's Higher Education Community Service Honor Roll. Being able to do this together is so uh, important and critical to us. Uh, at the Corporation for National Service, I have the responsibility of uh, being responsible for about 80,000 AmeriCorps members who serve all over the country. And I'm sure some of you know them, maybe some are family members, some of them maybe are individuals that you encourage to serve their country in AmeriCorps. It's a great experience. At the conclusion of your service, you earn an education award, which is the equivalent of the Pell Grant. It's about $5,500. And I'm suggesting to college presidents and individuals who represent institutions of higher education that there is an opportunity to match that education award at your institution. We have about 100 universities who match it around the country. And so as institutions of higher education, we, we recruit individuals for their academic record, uh, for their athletic experiences, but I'm suggesting we also recruit individuals for their commitment to community their commitment to build a service ethic on the campus. These would be wonderful individuals to entice by matching the Ed Award. And so if you are an institution who does match our Ed Award and you're here, thank you so very much. In fact, if there is anyone here that matches the Ed Award, would you wave your hand if you know you do that? Okay, well, we have some work to do. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things about service is it brings people together. We're all together, but it brings people from different parts of the political spectrum together. Uh, we learn to have courageous conversations when we're putting up sheetrock, when we're putting up blue tarps, when we're tutoring a child. Uh, those conversations come a little more natural when we're working together. And this year in our school turnaround AmeriCorps program, uh, Secretary Duncan was one of the leaders in this major effort uh, to enable us to bring over 600 AmeriCorps members to schools uh, that are failing, schools that are struggling, schools that are trying to turn around. Those individuals uh, are trying to make that difference and will make that difference. But um, one of the things that also makes a difference is individuals in, in higher education, the service they provide. I was up uh, earlier this year on the shores of uh, one of the town, small towns in New Jersey and working with an AmeriCorps team, we were mucking out an old house. 
that was owned by an 85-year-old. And as we were doing that, I stumbled across five students from Valparaiso University. They were all dressed in blue, hats, gloves, scarves, everything, uh, to protect from the mold that they were coming in contact with. And that was their spring break, uh, to spend it on the shores of New Jersey. And I said, well, at least you got to the beach. Um, and what's interesting, though, is uh, later that evening when I got back to Washington, D.C., I sent a note to the president of Valparaiso, and I said how impressed I was that his students were in New Jersey, standing with people, providing with hope to people who had lost hope, standing there trying to make a difference. And at 1.30 in the morning, he writes back, that's our students. And so I think that when you, when you look at uh, what service can do, uh, how it brings people together, how it exposes people to new options. That's what this is about. And so I'm going to end with um, a story. Uh, it's called um, Pink Icing, Pink Frosting, and Pink Cupcake. Uh, the pink tie is not part of it. But um, I was in Oklahoma City about three months ago, and we have an AmeriCorps team that works in a school that serves homeless children. And these children are children who live in the back seats of cars, in the back of pickup trucks. Um, they're the almost invisible homeless. They drive around. They don't have a real place to stay, but they stay in shopping centers and shopping malls. Uh, they stay all over the city. And so in Oklahoma City, there's this one school that provides uh, quality education to kids in that situation. And one of our AmeriCorps members said, you know, we had an interesting situation the other day in that an eight-year-old came up to me and tugged at my pants and said, I am so excited, it's my birthday. And she said, well, yeah, it's your birthday. No, it's my real birthday. And this is what I want. I want pink icing, a pink cupcake, and a pink birthday card. And so she was wondering, why are you so excited? You've had birthdays before. And then the telling moment, the eight-year-old said, I've never had a birthday. This is my first birthday. I've never received a card. I never had cupcakes. I never had glitter. And so I, sell, I tell that story because we're so focused on raising the academic standards, which we have to do. I'm saying let's not forget about the self-worth. Let not, let's not forget about the small but important milestones to mark a child's uh, progression through life. A child that has never had a birthday, has never had someone celebrate it, is something that you, that we all can do, uh, that we can bring that ability to someone and celebrate, recognize, expand that individual self-worth in their view of the world so that they could be the next person, the next person in their generation that not only graduates from high school and college, but it's the next person in that generation who will serve and serve our country and serve it well. Thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to share some observations with you. And uh, I'll be around later if you want to talk about this whole idea of matching the education award. Thank you very much. I have an exciting announcement before President DeGioia comes to make the most exciting announcement of the day as he introduced the secretary. We have promised you that we would have a formal report of the President's Interfaith and Community Service Campus Challenge we did not quite know how much bureaucracy would go into us getting it approved and finalized and everything, but it is now finalized and will be up on the website. And I just wanted you to see that it was done. And Ken Bedell and Anna Leach really get great, great, great credit for pushing the envelope to make sure that this was ready. So don't forget to go on the website to look at it, read it, hear the stories, see some of the examples of work that's been, been done as a part of the President's Interfaith and Community Service Campus Challenge. One more big clap for Anna and Ken for all the work to make this happen. And now a great big thank you again to President DeJoya for, for having welcomed us in this space and been such an integral part of this great meeting. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless. Well, thank you very much, Reverend Gerton Mitchell. And I know I speak on behalf of all of us to, you know, in expressing our deep appreciation to you for our, all of your leadership and dedication to community service and development as director of the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships within the department. 
And I want to thank all of you for your engagement over the course of these past two days to share your experiences, your challenges, your best practices in fostering interfaith dialogue and encouraging community service as part of the President's Interfaith and Community Service Challenge. It's been a privilege for Georgetown to host this important gathering, and I wish to take this moment to express my gratitude to some individuals who've joined us this afternoon for this conference's closing celebration, including Education Secretary Arnie Duncan. Secretary Duncan, it's always a privilege to have you here at Georgetown, and I look forward to more formally introducing you in just, just a moment. Again, to AmeriCorps Director Bill Basil, to the founder of, Inter of Interfaith Youth Corps, Ibu Patel, the students, including Georgetown's own Amr Hussein, who will shortly share reflections on their experiences with interfaith dialogue and service. Yesterday, I spoke briefly about the history that informs Georgetown's commitment to both interfaith dialogue and service to our world, and I hope that over, the past, over these past two days, you've had the opportunity to engage with each other and share your background and your context from which you approach this work. And it's also my hope that through this forum, you've been inspired to seize this moment, to respond in ever deeper ways to President Obama's challenge. And it's now my privilege to introduce to you Secretary of Education Arne Duncan. Having served as Secretary since January of 2009, he has shown a deep and unwavering commitment to our nation's students and teachers. This past May, he spoke here at Georgetown to our graduating students in our public policy program. And at that time, he shared reflections that shaped his commitment to service. He described the, the free after-school tutorial program that his mother founded at the corner of 46th and Greenwood in Chicago's Southside neighborhood. He shared that this experience of helping his mother shaped him in profound ways and guided his work and dedication to the pressing issue of improving educational opportunities in our country. Before being nominated as Secretary of Education by President Obama, he served as Chief Executive Officer of the nation's third largest school system, the Chicago Public Schools. During his tenure there, he focused on increasing access, expanding after-school and summer programs, and building public and private partnerships. While serving as secretary, he has continued to focus on issues of post-secondary education access and completion. He's leading the administration efforts to ensure that by 2020, the United States has the highest college graduation rate in the world. He's worked to increase Pell Grants to help more young women and men enroll in post-secondary education and complete a degree. And he's helped to establish a reduced student loan repayment plan for college graduates who enter low-paying jobs, as well as loan forgiveness for those who commit themselves to public service. Again, in front of our public policy graduates last spring, he shared some insights that resonate deeply with the work that we gather here to celebrate today. He said, a positive commitment is what gets remembered. Positive change is always worth the extra push. As we conclude this conference and you return to your communities, I invite you to remember Secretary Duncan's wisdom, that your commitment will be remembered, that your quest to bring about change, to make a difference in your communities, is always worth it. Secretary Duncan, it's always a pleasure to be able to welcome you back here to the Hilltop. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Arnie Duncan. Good afternoon, and President Joy, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I just love being on this campus and being in a room like this. I feel a little smarter, just trying to soak it up and reflect for a minute. Uh, it's pretty inspiring, and thank you for your tremendous leadership. Uh, to the corporation, Bill, you and Wendy, to Reverend Gerton Mitchell and all of our partners, I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to be pretty brief. I think I stand between you and a student panel. The student voice is a lot more important than my voice. Uh, Evil Patel is going to run. That's a good, good friend. Look forward to a fascinating conversation. So just a couple quick things. First of all, I just want to thank you for the extraordinary example you set for me and for the country. And we, you know, the numbers are sort of staggering collectively. 152 million hours of service over the past two years in this program. Over 100,000 students. 
250,000 adults, faculty members, administra administrators, uh, community partners. Numbers are pretty staggering, but obviously the numbers tell a small, small piece of the story. What you guys are doing every single day while you're hopefully getting good grades and working hard in class, while many of you are probably working to help pay your tuition and stay in school, you're helping lead the country where we need to go. And when you look at the challenges we face in Washington here today, um, all the skills you guys are demonstrating, the ability to listen, the ability to compromise, the ability to embrace diversity, the ability to see a community need and step into that void and not talk about it, not admire the problem, but actually act, we could sure use a lot of you guys in Congress. And I hope you guys are thinking about this for the long haul. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. Um, we as adults sometimes don't listen so well. We don't compromise. We don't see a problem and actually go solve it. And the initiative that you're taking, the example you're setting, not just for the younger students, not just for high school students and middle and elementary school students coming behind you, but the example you guys are setting for us as adults is extraordinarily profound. And hopefully the kinds of things you're doing, whether you go into a life of public service or whether you become a Wall Street banker or an investment manager, whatever it might be, that commitment to giving back is, is part of who you are. It's ingrained in you, in you. And it makes me very hopeful for all the challenges we face right now in Washington, with some of the, frankly, adult dysfunction that we face. I'm really, really hopeful about where the nation is going. It's because of young people like you and great adults who partner with you to provide these kinds of opportunities. As President Joy talked about, this work is really, really personal for me. Uh, my mother started a small after-school tutoring program in 1961. Um, her goal was to go down and help a little bit during the summer. Started trying to teach nine, uh, not a group of nine-year-old girls, about ten nine-year-old girls. She was going to do a little Bible study class, and she found out that none of those nine-year-olds could read. Nine-year-olds couldn't read, and it changed her life. And so 53 years later, her program's still going strong. Raised my sister and brother and I as a part of it, literally from the time we were born, and we've all tried to follow in her footsteps in various ways. It was an absolutely formative experience. And her whole philosophy was that you're both taught and teaching others at the same time. So 10-year-olds taught 5-year-olds, 15-year-olds taught 10-year-olds. And the young man who uh, had the very difficult task of teaching me and my friends, uh, just tell you a little bit about him. He uh, grew up, never met his dad. Um, his mother, frankly, ran the streets, saw her occasionally, wasn't really part of his life, was raised by his grandmother, somehow avoided the gangs, somehow avoided all the temptations of the streets, and uh, not only was he one of the best teachers I had ever in my life, and I was lucky enough to go to some extraordinary universities, he's now one of the top black uh, research scientists in our country, one of the top 50 research scientists. His name is Kerry Holly, works, works at IBM. And what I learned from Kerry, and what I learned from so many of my friends on my mother's program, is that despite very real obstacles of poverty, despite very real obstacles of violence in the community, despite very real obstacles of family dysfunction, our children have amazing, amazing potential. And I saw many young men and women like Carrie, because my mother and others were in their lives, go on to do extraordinary things. One young man, Ronald Raglan, helped me manage the Chicago Public Schools. Another, unfortunately, passed fairly recently, Michael Clark Duncan, but he went on to be a Hollywood movie star. And this is from a tiny little couple block radius in one little neck of Chicago. And while it inspires me every day, it also challenges me because I think of all the kids who didn't have those kinds of opportunities and the extraordinary loss of human potential. And what you guys are doing in your volunteer works, in your tutoring, in your mentoring, in your enrichment activities, in your rebuilding homes, rebuilding communities, you're giving young people who aren't born of all the advantages a chance to do something extraordinary. And all of, many of you maybe have overcome real obstacles, but you're on your way to success. By definition, you're in this room, you're in college, you're living that dream. And we just need a lot more young people in this country to have those kinds of opportunities. We have some positive trends, things going the right way. High school graduation rates are at three decade highs. Dropout rates are down. But at the end of the day right now, we still lose about 25% of our nation's young children from our schools to our streets. That's about a million young kids dropping out every single year. And they are basically condemned to poverty and social failure. There's nothing out there for them. And times have changed. When I was growing up in the south side of Chicago, wasn't the greatest of things that my friends could drop out and go get a pretty good job at the stockyards and steel mills and own their own home and support a family and have a pretty good life. Those jobs are gone and they're never coming back. Everyone in this country, every young person 
has to graduate from high school in some form of higher education, whether it's Georgetown University, or one of your many fine universities, fantastic community college, trade, technical, vocational training, some form of learning beyond high school has to be the norm for every single person in this country. And if we do that, then we're gonna keep great jobs in this country, we're gonna have more upward mobility, social mobility than we've had, and if we don't have that, we're gonna be a country of the haves and the have-nots. And we're gonna see the good jobs of the future go to those countries that are investing in education and making sure they have a highly skilled workforce. So the work you're doing every single day is not just helping young people and their families, it's helping to strengthen communities, and ultimately it's helping to strengthen our country. And so on behalf of the president, I thank you for the remarkable commitment to see young leaders like you making such a huge difference across the nation. Again, gives me tremendous hope for where we're going. And whatever you choose to do the rest of your life, keep finding ways to give back. Keep finding ways to give back. It's going to be one of the most meaningful and important things you can do. So I thank you for your service. I thank you for the example you set for all of us. Thank you for making a difference in our communities. We owe you a great debt of gratitude. Thanks for having me here today. No, I always say that uh, people ask one question of, of anybody on stage, anybody who's a leader, whether that's an artist or uh, a performer or a government official or a college president or an interfaith leader, they ask the question, do I believe you? Um, we believe you, Secretary Duncan. We want to thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. And I want to thank you as a fellow Chicagoan for somebody who believed in Interfaith Youth Corps when it was basically nine voices talking in my head back in 2002, my colleague April Mendez and myself before we were helping run conferences here in DC. Uh, every time you would see me, you would stop and say, hey, how's that organization going? How are you doing nurturing young leaders? So I want to thank you for believing in this work early and in believing in young people your, your entire life. Uh, there's a great line by the poet Gwendolyn Brooks who lived not far from where you grew up. Um, um, she writes, as, on behalf of young people, I shall create, if not a note, a whole, if not an overture, a desecration. Right? So that's a line about the power of young people. And sometimes that power is channeled in a destructive direction, and our job is to channel it in a really positive and beautiful direction. And I think that's what we're all about today, and the folks on stage are masters of, of symphonies of interfaith cooperation. And I think that this is... This panel is one of the highlights of the conference because these are folks who uh, ran into a lot of obstacles when it came to interfaith work and persevered and have run some pretty impressive things on their campuses and communities. And the one charge I gave them in this panel was do not be shy. Right? Tell us about what you did that was really powerful, that you're really proud of. Because there's 100 students in this room and dozens and dozens of administrators and staff and faculty and college campuses who are asking the question, what's really possible in interfaith cooperation? And you guys embody that. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce them very, very briefly. Uh, to my far left is Anastasia Young, who uh, goes to... Uh, who lives in Moorhead, Minnesota, goes to Concordia College, double majoring in nursing and religion, and is Christian. Uh, on her right is my friend Amir Hussein, who's a senior here at Georgetown, studying government and theology, uh, heading pre-med. I just uh, put the final glow on, his, uh, on a letter of recommendation for him for the Rhodes Scholarship, so inshallah, that goes well. We're proud of you, Georgetown is proud of you, uh, and you exemplify as your other panelists do interfaith leadership. On, on Amir's right is uh, my friend uh, Sara Rahim, who's a senior at St. Louis University, majoring in public health, international studies, working towards proficiency in French and Arabic, has done some really excellent interfaith programs that cross campus and community boundaries. And finally, my friend Tyler Coles, who's a senior at Roanoke College, he identifies as a pagan, uh, hosted me on campus there about six months ago. It was a terrific trip and just one small part of the amazing interfaith work you're doing there. So my first question to all of you, and we'll start all the way on the left with Anastasia. Tell us a bit about your personal story, right? Why is this work compelling to you? When did you get bit by the interfaith bug and make the decision that you were going to be an interfaith leader? So for me, my interfaith journey really started when I got to Concordia and was engaged in my Religion 100 class, Christianity and Religious Diversity. This was the first opportunity that I had to explore other religions outside of my own tradition of Christianity and really started allowing me to ask questions of what does it mean to be a Christian in a very diverse world and how can I engage and how does my, my identity as a Christian relate to people of other faith and non-faith traditions. And so through that class, as well as conversations with my professor, I decided to study abroad the following year in India. And it was in my time in India that I really started to see people of interfaith, um, of different religions coming together to make their community a better place. 
And one example of this that really has stuck with me was my time in Bhopal, India. And here I saw two women, a Muslim woman and a Hindu woman, create a healthcare system to provide free cares to people in Bhopal who suffer from um, the effects of a chemical gas explosion. And these women are coming from their own faith traditions to serve the community in a really powerful way. And so through that experience, um, I really started to think about how can I bring what I'm seeing here back to Concordia? And I was a little bit nervous because when I had left for India, the only avenue into faith conversations was through campus ministry. And that's a great place for conversations of religion, but I really wanted to find a way to delve into conversations with interfaith. But little did I know that they had hired um, a new person to our campus, Dr. Jacqueline Bussey, who's in the audience, um, to, as the director of the Forum on Faith and Life. And that is really where all of our interfaith initiatives are rooted. And so through conversations with her and her own commitment to interfaith work, I was able to plug into interfaith work on our campus. Great, thank you. Amir. Um, when, I, when I told my family I wanted to go to Georgetown, they were mostly okay with it, except for this one like weird uncle that I had who said, don't send him to Georgetown, he'll become Catholic. So, <laughs> so my, my, I remember what my father said that day. He said, I've gone to Catholic school my entire life, and I'm still a Muslim, so we'll see what happens to Amir. <laughs> so when I came to Georgetown, I was really interested in uh, kind of exploring my own identity, but I wasn't so sure about how I would engage with other people. Uh, but when I came here, I remember attending this one event called the Fasathon. Um, and it was during the Muslim Ram month of Ramadan. And all the religions came together and spoke about their personal traditions about fasting and why that was important to them. And one of the speakers who really motivated me was Imam Hindley, who was in the audience right now. And through events like that, and I saw so many other events at Georgetown, I was wondering, why is our school so committed to this? I went back and realized that our Jesuit identity really is something that permeates the campus. Jesuits are all about interreligious understanding and fostering a community and diversity. And because of that, I decided to research more by my own tradition. I was sure that those values were there somewhere, but I didn't exactly know how that I could really say those to other people. And through that, I, I went to Muslim students' events. I became more involved in my own community. I realized that there was so much in, in Islam that was also committed to interfaith that I had never known before. And coming to Georgetown and engaging the other religions here showed me that I could become stronger in my own faith community while engaging with other people. And I remember the, the, the highlight of this was at an Interfaith Youth Corps camp, uh, conference a few years ago when there was, it was a Friday and there was no imam there to lead the prayers. So some of the staff asked me, why don't you just step up and do it? You're the only one who can. And I said, I am 20 and most people who do this are 50 and have long beards. <laughs> And I don't really know Arabic, so I can't do it. And they said, well, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. So I said, OK. So I took out my iPhone. I used the iQuran app. And I found, <laughs> <laughs> and I searched for interfaith and something that related to that. And through that, I created a very ghetto khutbah that <laughs> incorporated some of, those, some of those values. But at the end, I realized that it was only because of interfaith that I was even able to do those things. I was even interested in learning about my own tradition. So that's something that's been motivating me for the past three years, trying to get in touch with my own tradition while also engaging with other people. Thank you. Sarah. So my interfaith story, like many other first-generation American Muslims, um, began on September 11th, 2001. Um, I grew up predominantly, um, I'm Pakistani-American. I like to call myself a third culture kid growing up in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. Um, at the time of 9-11, I was in fourth grade, um, about to turn 10 years old, and I went to an Islamic school in the suburbs of Chicago. So, um, you know, my doctors are Muslim, and my teachers are Muslim, my classmates were all Muslim. It was very much a homogenous bubble of Islam. Um, I woke up the morning of 9-11 and glanced over at my television and I saw a plane crash into the Twin Towers. Um, I wasn't really sure what to make of it being a nine-year-old, and then I saw a second plane crash into the second building. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what to make of it, and I went to school that day being normal, thinking, you know, something bad had happened. Um, and then I remember the teachers making an announcement on the, um, throughout the school saying we had to go into the gymnasium for an emergency meeting. And at that meeting, they told us that they believed what had happened was an act of terror and that it was being led by what was thought of a fundamentalist Islamic group. 
Um, I remember throughout that whole announcement and thinking, oh God, please don't let them be Muslim. Um, the years that followed kind of culminated into me realizing that a lot of my friends who were non-Muslim kind of went from knowing nothing about Islam to knowing what was on the media, which wasn't the best. So um, life continued on. I remember the first two weeks after 9-11, my school was shut down, and we had received neighboring threats kind of in backlash from certain other religious organizations towards my Islamic school. So for me as a nine-year-old, I didn't really understand um, this hate and bigotry coming towards the Muslim community and why people were so angry or upset. Um, I remember you know, eventually going on to public school and entering the real world and kind of becoming more proactive in discourse around Islam and what it means to be a positive Muslim role model. And um, even me deciding to wear a headscarf on a random Wednesday when I was 16 years old and the repercussions that came with that. But also realizing that it was through my actions and my positive discourse that people were realizing the stereotypes that breed at that level and how to dispel them. So I definitely became you know, that positive, word vomiting, poster child of the goodness of Islam in high school. Um, but I would say my first entry into interfaith actually began when I received my acceptance letter at St. Louis University. Um, that summer, our freshman read was Ibu's book, Acts of Faith. And at that time, I was just kind of a very active Muslim leader. And it wasn't until I realized reading his book that the word interfaith even existed. Um, I think there's a very com comfortable complacency that exists in coexisting in your faith community. So for me, being the token Muslim girl was enough. But to actively seek these relationships and create mutual responsibility and respect throughout traditions, that was taking that complacency a step further. So um, I went to SLU that fall. I read Ibu's book, fell in love with interfaith. And he came to SLU that fall and spoke to our university. And I remember being so taken aback by his words and how much solidarity I found in this mutual respect that came from all traditions. And um, here I am, you know, three days later, three years later, um, working for Interfaith, promoting service events on and off campus, and continuing to find solidarity that I couldn't find in my own faith community, that I find in other traditions across all values. So that was definitely my entryway into Interfaith. Thank you for that. Tyler. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Tyler. Um, as an individual ha who identifies as a pagan, um, most people who do identify as pagan nowadays are not raised as pagans in the United States. Um, there are some individuals who are brought up in these households, but it's fairly new. Um, I was actually what you can consider a convert to modern pagan traditions. I'm from Southwest Virginia, uh, a moderately sized city called Roanoke, Virginia, uh, smack dab in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. And as many of you can um, not, you know, might not be surprised, growing up in the South, um, identifying at that time um, as a pagan presented some challenges. Um, as a, you know, growing up in the Bible Belt has its own connotations with it. When I came across paganism, it was actually out of my own personal spiritual experience that I had at a Christian summer camp. And once I left Christianity, I actually learned a, a, a deep-seated uh, appreciation for the Christian tradition, for the teachings, um, and for the figure that is Christ himself. Going on throughout the, my later years in high school, I was afraid to announce myself as a pagan and the spiritual experience that I went through and the things that I believed in. And it wasn't until my involvement until I got into college that this really began to change. I, was, I can still remember, and often I hear this a lot, um, that members of the pagan community still to this day experience situations where they're afraid of announcing their faith because they're afraid of losing their children, losing their jobs, being ostracized for their from their communities. And it's hard to believe that can happy, happen anywhere in the world, let alone here in the United States. So my freshman year when I arrived to campus, I was one of three um, outspoken pagans. I decided if my community wanted to go somewhere, if we wanted to find acceptance, if we wanted to find something more than tolerance, if we wanted to find understanding, and if we wanted to interact with our brothers and sisters, no matter what religious or non-religious tradition we came through, it was going to have to take the work of us as individuals to get that to occur. And it's been uh, going on four years. I'm a senior now at Roanoke. And I've seen these relationships form um, and grow and prosper. Some of my biggest allies uh, at Roanoke College are uh, members from various Christian denominations. We're the second oldest Lutheran uh, institution in the United States. Um, and it's great to really have my brothers and sisters in the Lutheran tradition um, to support me along that way. Cool. OK, one more question. So. Tell us about the interfaith initiative you've led on campus that 
is you're most proud of, right? And again, you, all of you are humble. You live up to your faith traditions, command for humility in this. But in this case, I don't want you to be humble. I want you, I want you to, to, you're not doing this for yourselves. You're doing this as an act of service for folks in the audience to help them. Some of whom have run similar initiatives. Some of whom are just getting started. Imagine what could be. So I want to start with Sarah on this. I'm going to go Sarah, Tyler, Anastasia, Amr, and this will be the last question. I would say that the biggest interfaith initiative I'm most proud of happened last August, and it happened in response to um, the Sikh Gurdwara shooting in Oak Creek and the Joplin Mosque burning down. Um, I had just finished an internship at IFYC, and I remember thinking of how we could respond to these acts of religious bigotry. So I got together with um, our Interfaith Alliance, and we organized a candlelight vigil. And I remember, rising, um, I remember engaging with the Sikh, the Hindu, and the Muslim community, and as well as the Christian and um, non-faith communities as well. And we brought together over 100 people to attend this vigil. Um, we had reflection and commemoration and prayers and all traditions represented. And it was a really powerful way to really engage all communities in solidarity. So that was definitely one of the, um, I think, brightest moments of community that I felt last year. Cool. All right. I think for me personally, we exist. The Interfaith Council of Roanoke College uh, is a, a, a fairly new organization on campus, and uh, recently we have just created an interfaith initiative on our campus that was kind of a meeting ground between students like myself, as well as um, the higher-ups, the president and the board of trustees, and we kind of met in the middle, and they saw that the Interfaith Council, not even a complete year old yet, um, was really leading the groundwork um, for interfaith cooperation to really occur. When I started hosting the Interfaith Week um, my freshman year, it kind of just started out as a, um, a golden dream that many people thought, this is this, this pagan um, has this idea that he can bring all these people together of different religions, and he's a pagan at a Lutheran school. This is not going to happen. <laughs> um, and four years later, we're an organization that is operating, that I have students who are, just came in as freshmen who are coming up with ideas that I can't even keep up with yet. And I know that now it's possible, that it's more than just you know, a golden dream of myself, that this will continue on after me, long, long after me, and that this is going to affect a whole lot more people than I will ever get to meet. Anastasia. So last year, Better Together became an established organization on our campus, and we took part in Be Blue Day, which is the National Day of Interfaith Awareness and Community Service. And so on that day, we had Better Together members wear blue and pass out blue to people who weren't um, aware of interfaith on our campus and talk about how to get involved in interfaith. And then we had hosted a lunch that allowed students, faculty, staff, and administration to talk about the interfaith work happening on our campus. And for most of those students, it was the first time they were able to talk about why interfaith work is important on our campus and to them personally with administration, faculty, and staff. And then our day ended with a community service project. And so we're located on the Red River. And lately, it's been flooding every year, so there's a really big need for sandbagging. And so to prepare for the flood, we had a group of students come together to fill sandbags. And what was really unique about this group was it wasn't just Better Together that went. Um, we had students from the Evangelical Student Organization, from the Secular Club, from Better Together, and then students who just heard about the event and wanted to come. And through that event, those conversations started to happen that hadn't been happening on our campus. And we still see those friendships developing today. And so even though it was just one day of service, the relationships that were built through the Interfaith Awareness and Service Project are continuing on our campus. You know, I'm, I'm loving these stories because it's, it, you guys exemplify for me the definition of a leader, which is somebody who creates opportunities for other people to experience their power and dignity. So Sarah, when you talk about, you know, standing up against the arson, against the Joplin Mosque, or against the hate crimes, against the Sikh community, it's an opportunity that other people have to experience their dignity again, especially after like a moment of deep fear. And Tyler talking about the freshmen getting involved in an organization you started, or the folks getting involved in that Red River, uh, uh, making sure that it doesn't flood again and, 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 and uh, uh, hurt the town of Moorhead, that, that's powerful stuff. So I, it's, I'm thinking about this because I asked a question about your leadership, and I recognize that when people, people are leaders like you are, what it does is it creates a whole new class of leaders. So Amr, take us out on this and tell us your story of this. 
Uh, Georgetown religion actually isn't that divisive. What really divisive is sports. So, <laughs> and I'm sure many of colleges will probably have a similar experience that you have a rival that you absolutely hate and want them to lose all the time. Um, and so for us, that was Syracuse University. And we didn't just compete over, over sports, we competed over everything. The first year of the President's Challenge, we also competed with them to have the best Better Together campaign. Um, and I remember, and then we were playing, we were also, we were gonna play them in basketball that year because they were still in the same conference as us. And a couple of students, me and some of my friends at Syracuse decided, why don't we try to make this competition something that's productive instead of being, you know, a competition. So why don't we compete to have the best interfaith campaign? So some people, we got together and we decided one of the issues that's so common in both DC and upstate New York is hunger and homelessness. So we decided we will compete to raise the most amount of canned food and non-perishable food items for the local homeless community. So what we tried to do was try to make this as much a competition as possible. So we got our basketball teams involved, they endorsed the initiative, and uh, over the period of seven days in the beginning of February, we basically are in, we sold it to our campuses as a way to beat the other school. We all tried to bring as many cans as possible and have as much uh, possible community service. Um, and at the end, we announced our results at the Georgetown Syracuse halftime game. And we raised about 1,600 pounds of food for the, jointly for the communities in both of, our, both of our areas. And at the end, we actually lost track of the competition. We, didn't really, we don't realize who actually won or, I mean, Syracuse won the game, but that doesn't count. Um, <laughs> Um, and we realized that the, the sports rivalry was, was so bad, but since both our campuses had such a, a commitment to interfaith work, that was able to transcend that boundary. So I suggest any of you who have a really bad sports rival, try competing with them for interfaith work. It might actually have the same result that we did. Yeah, that's a great, so it reminds me of a, cor a chronic line about competing in good works, right? right? So beautiful. So I'm gonna ask one more quick question. I think we might actually have time for a couple questions. If folks don't mind a little bit of shuffling in the aisles, what's happening is, is uh, uh, there's been a set of campuses invited to take pictures with Secretary Duncan and I think Director Rogers as well. So if folks don't mind a little bit of shuffling, um, I think we can do one more quick question and then, and then audience questions if there are. Uh, so here's my last question. Let's do 30 seconds on this, okay? If we're successful, what does our work look like in 20 years? How is America different? How is higher education different? How is the world different if our movement for interfaith leadership and interfaith cooperation is successful? And let's with Anastasia and just go straight down the line about 30 seconds each. So for my vision of America in 20 oh. years, oh. I see a place where people are fully appreciated for their whole identity because of their religious and non-religious tradition. I see a place where the bridge that we build today, we're walking hand in hand across, appreciating the stones that have been laid, but knowing the need for this work to continue. I see a place where a Muslim man can come to our community and speak at convocation and people are like, of course, it doesn't matter that it's a Lutheran institution, but of course, a Muslim man is welcome to speak in our community. Beautiful. Thank yeah, I think I, I, com I completely agree with that. I think the best thing we can do is make it so interfaith isn't like its own thing. Interfaith is something that just happens naturally. So uh, Eva was mentioned, there's so many sectors that have interfaith going on, like medicine and public service and, and all these different fields that um, if we make interfaith so, so integral to America, it'll just be something that happens without us really promoting it as explicitly interfaith. I agree. Um, not to preach to the choir, but I see a time of the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King um, and mobilizing people across different race divisions and bringing them together and working for the common good and finding that solidarity. I see faith as the same issue as mobilizing all of us and hopefully generations to come to speak about faith and public discourse openly and to find that solidarity and um, that common action and that we can breed a culture of inclusivity for everyone. I agree with all of my colleagues up here, but I think one of the things is when I look in 20 years into the future, I can see a day in which um, a pagan no longer has to worry about losing their children, um, where a Muslim woman no longer has to worry about um, being objectified when going through airport security or any of those other um, situations across our country, and for that matter, across that, the world, um, where we can, you know, join together and not have to really worry about such things, and where we can interact and really change the world um, based off of and motivated out of our religious and non-religious um, backgrounds. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there beautiful... There are a couple questions from the audience. Professor Bussey, I see you there proudly taking pictures of your student. Don't think you're going unnoticed. Any questions from the audience for these terrific students? 
pop up and yep. Why don't you just pop up and shout it out loud? That's a great question. Why, why is service a great vehicle for interfaith dialogue and, and cooperation? I would say, um, just to speak to that, I think when you issue, like, try to orient around civic society, you can look at certain issues of justice, and there's this fear of not necessarily polarizing or politicizing certain issues, but I think service is something we can universally agree on. Um, there's, instead of engaging in dialogue right away, you can say, hey, I think we want to improve this. So it's definitely something that can I think unify people across all traditions to begin with, and it's an awesome foundation to have. Okay. Great. Um, I, uh, I was just told to tell people to go to the microphone. Thank you for that. Um, so that's a, thank you for that. So does somebody else have a comment on, on why service is a great vehicle for interfaith discussion and cooperation? Um, I think it, it's one of those things that I know personally, when I grew up in especially elementary school and middle school, I had the, um, character pillars, um, and service was one of those character pillars. And it's just something, no matter what religious or non-religious um, background you come from, it's just something that's rooted in part of our culture. And one of the things in doing um, service through this interfaith initiative, we gained something that I know me and Amr and um, Sar probably learned through our coach training with the uh, um, IFYC is the appreciative knowledge we can learn from one another. So I can learn something from, uh, what you know, from, say, an Orthodox Jew that I had never met before, but I can now know them as a person. And through the, meeting that one person, it kind of has a ripple effect into, okay, I can understand what other Orthodox Jews think like and how they process and how they meet the rest of the world in those situations. Great. Thank you for that. Why don't we go to more questions? We'll get some more questions into the room. Yeah. You all seem like such wonderful leaders, and you're all seniors and are going to graduate soon. I'm wondering, what are you going to do with interfaith in the rest of your life, in your careers? That's a terrific question. That's a really great question, and one that I'm working on. Um, <laughs> so my major is nursing and religion. Um, I am looking at how this understanding of healing that we can receive through interfaith dialogue and healing that we see in medicine, how can we bring those two things together? How can we recognize interfaith dialogue as a sense of healing? So I'm not quite sure what that looks like in a job, but that is something that I'm pursuing. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that y you as a job candidate is going to be really attractive to a whole set of hospitals and health centers, right? Places that are highly religiously diverse, places where people are praying all the time for all sorts of things, births and deaths, etc. Somebody who has an appreciative knowledge of religious diversity and is able to engage positively with people from different faith and secular backgrounds, I would think that would be a huge asset. So... Uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, there's probably many of us schools that don't have or are beginning to start multi-faith, interfaith discussions that don't have a tradition of it. From your four years and your experience being multi-faith leaders on your campus, what advice would you give for a program, schools, that really want to get off the ground and start? I can answer that. I think one thing that works really well is if you find something that in your school's um, identity or history or, or traditions that somehow relate to interfaith. And the thing is, you need to start where what is comfortable for you. Um, you don't want to jump to like the sixth possible step when you haven't done the first five. So if, you're, if the, your school is very Christian, for example, um, one thing that's very, very useful is ecumenical dialogue. It's not explicitly interfaith, but it definitely helps bring out um, the same kind of conversation that you want to happen. And if your school is very not religious, perhaps start with service. And we just talked about how that's such a unifying idea. So I think my best advice is find something in your school's tradition that will help you do that. Hi, thank you guys for coming. Um, I just have a question somewhat related to that. What was your initial conversation starter maybe to get people involved? Because, you know, some sadly have stereotypes and we have barriers that we have up. How did you break those and how did you kind of start things? Great question. Sara and Tyler, why don't you take us, why don't you respond to that and take us out? So I go to St. Louis University, which is a Catholic Jesuit institution. And when I joined, we had had interfaith for about a year or two. But I remember that the word interfaith was really scary to a lot of people. I think they think it's very either kumbaya or a watering down of faiths or just the fear of losing your own. Sorry. So I think um, how I approached it was just approaching established faith communities on campus already. Like um, I'm a very active member of the Muslim Student Association. And partnering with them on certain events and kind of bringing elements of interfaith dialogue into those events. And from there, kind of building a community and understanding of what interfaith is. And I mean, 
it's really the friends you bring to these meetings and that kind of thing. So kind of build your social network from established things and then slowly bring interfaith into that. So that's definitely how we built up our interfaith campus group. Um, I think you can blame my grandmother for it almost. Um, I was raised by, my grandmother had a, a hand in raising me and she definitely had a part in me becoming um, a little um, bullheaded and very much taking charge of things. Uh, freshman year, I had hand in helping to form um, the uh, Pagan Fellowship of Roanoke College on our campus. And there was some um, rumors going around that a large Christian organization that still exists on our campus was going to have some issues with our existence as, a, an, as an organized group, um, and that there might have, be a little scuffle here and there along the way. And what I did was I took that situation, because this is the same time in which the first interfaith event really uh, sprang up in the interfaith week that kind of sprang out of that um, occurred. I took those rumors in that situation, and I cracked uh, I crafted it along the way of, you might be interested in this, and I, I met other people along the way um, saying that I as a pagan, as you as a Christian, um, as an evangelical Christian, can sit down, have conversations, not only about football, um, fried chicken, but also about <laughs> our theological similarities and our theological differences. Yes. You know, I, I got to say, when I, when I look at you guys up here telling these stories, I mean, I've known a lot of you for four years, right, since you were first-year students, and, and to think about the role that you're playing in creating spaces for other people's empowerment and dignity and leadership, I mean, it's really powerful, right? And it, it makes me think that so many of our interfaith heroes were, were stunningly young, not just when they began, but when they actually did world-changing work. So Martin Luther King Jr. in Montgomery in 1955, when he started leading the bus boycott, was 26. So you guys have a couple years to continue to prepare before your world-changing thing, but, but it's, it, is a, it, is, it is not a rare tale to wake up and recognize just how young so many of our heroes are. I mean, Gandhi was even younger, was 24 in South Africa when he get, begins his movement against the past laws. And the Dalai, Dalai Lama is, I think, 22 or 23 when he leads people out of occupied Tibet into India, right? So, so there is a tradition of young people as interfaith leaders changing the world, and it's amazing to watch a group of people right in front of us following in that tradition. So I have a heart full of gratitude right now, a heart full of gratitude for everybody who came, for all of the work you're doing on your campuses, for all the work you are going to do on your campuses. One of the greatest privileges I have is going to a number of campuses every year, and I'm just wowed every time. It's what I've been doing this work professionally for 11 years and, and total for 15 years, and it's because I see what Tyler's doing at Roanoke, what Anastasia is doing at Concordia, and I'm like, this is amazing. We're building a social movement, and it's remarkable to be at the beginning of something like that. A, a huge heart full of gratitude for my friends and colleagues at the Department of Ed, at the White House, at CNCS, for Brenda, for Director Basil, uh, for Ken, for Melissa Rogers, for Arnie Duncan. This, bridges don't fall from the sky, convenings don't fall from the sky, right? So, Brenda, take two days off and we start planning next year's in two days, <laughs> right? Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you to my colleagues at Interfaith Youth Corps for being as good of a staff as one could imagine at any type of organization. Deep love for all of you. Final words from the 1893 Parliament of the World's Religions in Chicago, I think, to send us off. And this is the purpose of our work. From now on, the great traditions of the world make war no longer on each other and instead on the giant ills that afflict humankind. Thank you. Incredible time. We've made it to this point. One more time. I still have some beautiful purple glasses. Uh, if someone lost them, they were down here near the front. And just to, to leave you with a, a closing thought, I woke up this morning. I don't watch a lot of television, but there's a commercial that I've seen that just stayed in my head last night. The little kids, I think it's AT&T, so I'm not making a commercial for them, but I think it's them. And they're talking to the little children. And I actually went online to find out if these were actors. And they said, no, these kids are unscripted. These are unfiltered responses. And I think the first question is, what's better, fast or slow? Any of you seen that commercial? And so the kids give these really clever answers about, well, fast is better. Well, do you know something that's slow? My grandma's slow. And I woke up this morning just thinking about the convening and, and, and what we could say in our own spirits about, about what's better as a result of the work that we're trying to do together. What's better to 
see somebody and not see them? What's better, to see a problem and not try to serve? What's, what's better, to hold somebody's hand instead of hitting somebody's head? What's better, seeking war and seeking peace? What's better, that we, if we keep asking ourselves, what's better, to believe differently and not to believe at all? What's better? Together. Somebody was paying attention over there. So we really are better together, even with our differences if we're willing to just reach out and, and connect and care and commit ourselves to doing those things that help bring our common humanity, our intrinsic self-worth to the top of the pile. And if I think about the things that make me tick, if you don't know what makes me tick, you don't really know how to work with me. But if you don't ever ask me, you may never find out. The same is true for each and every one of us. So all of our stories are an important part we thank you for being here. We urge you to share your stories and involve new characters so that we, when we convene the next time, our storybook is even bigger. We thank you for your patience, your dedication, your diligence today. The last group of those who are to have their pictures taken should just meet Anna Leach at that back door and she'll take you to the place where there's to be done. Pick up your certificates and do one last thing for me. Turn to somebody near you and just tell them thank you as Ibu says, with a grateful heart for being with us today, and give yourselves a final hand, a round of applause. Go in peace.